So it's lecture three, and the first thing I wanted to do, I wanted to start where I ended last time and explain what are those uh, cluster Poisson uh, varieties and the requantization. And so last time we started to discuss this, so I remind you that we have a notion of a quiver, which is a data given by a lattice, lambda, a collection of basis vectors. Uh, let's start from uh, bilinear form uh, on this lattice, then collection of basis vectors, and a subcollection in this collection, which we call frozen vectors, and some collection of uh, integers which are called skewsymmetrizers. And so the most important uh, thing about this that this uh, form takes value in one half z. It's half integers, this valued form. Uh, it's not skewsymmetric, so far just bilinear form. But there is a condition. The condition is that uh, Ei, Ej is actually in z. Uh, unless uh, both frozen. So this means uh, that this subset of basis vectors we call frozen vectors, and so the form takes integral values, except uh, the form between the two frozen vectors can be actually half integer. Now, then we uh, were talking last time about mutations of these quivers. Uh, so, there are some people who were not here before, so if you feel that you want me to ask a question, so please do it, because that's the basic definition. Okay. So uh, uh, then we have quiver uh, mutations. Basically, it's called quiver because you call this vertices, and uh, you measure this by linear form, and you connect two vertices by a number of arrows, which given by this by linear form could be half integer, uh, and this vectors generate this lattice. So, if you start with this vectors, you can omit the lattice. So just vertices and arrows. Okay. Now the important uh, formula was sta statement was that we have mutations. So you have k is one of these unfrozen vertices. So uh, Ek is unfrozen. Then uh, you start with one quiver and you get another quiver. And so this new quiver has everything the same. So this will be the same, this will be the same, this will be the same. This is the only data which changes. And it changes by the following formula that Ei prime is uh, Ei plus uh, you evaluate your form on e i k, take the positive value, it takes the value if it's positive and put zero if it's negative, so you cut it somehow by this plus e k and minus e k. So this is a situation when i is not equal to k and this is a situation when i equals to k. So that's the basic formula. Now we discussed uh, uh, the fact that uh, as soon as you have a quiver, uh, you have so the square C assigns you quantum torus algebra. And so this quantum torus algebra, uh, you can say mm, that it has uh, generators x lambda, where lambda is any vector of your lattice. And the multiplication rule is that x lambda times, times x mu is q to the lambda mu of x lambda plus mu. Now at this moment you can ask, if you were not here before, you can ask what this symbol means. It's almost this form, but uh, slightly corrected by the skewsymmetrizers because we want this expression to be skewsymmetric. And so you write down definition Ei and J is the form we had multiplied by dj inverse. Okay, now you have quantum torus. So it's uh, it depends. So at the moment, Q is a formal symbol, but very soon uh, it will be actual number, and that's very important. 
So uh, now uh, we have the notion of quantum mutations. That's a key definition. Uh, uh, so quantum mutation, you have to uh, say that you start with some seed, uh, some quiver, let's say C, and you go to C prime, and you go from here to here, so you put H, and then you have K, which indicates the non-frozen vector which you're going to use for this mutation. And so by definition, this is a uh, birational isomorphism, which means it's isomorphism of fraction fields. So it takes the fraction field of the uh, quantum torus algebra, which is denoted OQ of T C prime. And uh, you map it isomorphically to the fraction field of a similar algebra uh, related to the uh, quiver C. So quantum torus algebra is denoted this way. So this is the algebra which we defined. And this uh, transformation, we denoted it uh, C goes to C prime, K. That's this transformation. Now, how this transformation is defined? So uh, it's, by definition, defined as follows. So most importantly, it's a conjugation by the quantum dialogarithm. So let's just write how it works. It takes y here, and uh, it goes to the following expression. So first of all, we apply some monomial transformation to y, which I'm going to spell in a second. And then we take the conjugation by the quantum dialogarithm. Uh, And so this quantum dialogarithm, uh, so far just a Pohammer symbol, so just 1 plus qx times 1 plus q cube x times 1 plus q to 5x and so on, inverse. So, all right. Mm, so who is i? Who is this isomorphism i? So this isomorphism i from C to C prime, uh, x by the rules that it takes any basis vector x e i prime, which is basis vector, you know, that basis vector is just defined. And it maps it just uh, to x uh, defined by that, basically by that formula, so mu, mu k of e i. So what, what's happening? is that uh, we say that, OK, look, so we have two different quivers. This is quiver C prime, and this is quiver C. So in the quiver uh, C prime, we uh, decided to talk about new variables EI prime. But this is actually they're given by this formula. So I'm just writing this down. So I'm just writing kind of this notation through this notation. So it's kind of identical. Uh, uh, it's just some kind of monomial transformation which is written there, but formally write it this way. So you take this monomial transformation, and then most importantly, you conjugate this by the quantum dialogarithm power series. And the remarkable fact is that, yes, you get uh, a rational transformation. So let's do an example which shows uh, how this works. So uh, we take a quiver which looks this way. So it's going from two, it's two and one are the two vertices. And then we do mutation at the vertex 1. So we get this kind of quiver. So it's still 1 and 2. And so here the formulas uh, I'm just writing to make sure that uh, I use correct uh, conventions. And so here uh, the formula x1 prime, x2 prime equals q square x2 prime, x1 prime. So that's the input. Now we need to make some uh, transformation. So you probably said this before, but so when you write uh, arrow, this means? This means that we have a, this means that the, uh, this bilinear form between this and this equals to 1. And the other way around? Uh, the other way around, it depends on skew symmetrizers. But in this particular example, it equals to minus 1. Because I happened, uh, in this case, I consider skew symmetric situation. So the skew symmetrizers 
the important only here. So this form is skew-symmetric by definition. And this one not necessarily. But in the example, it is skew-symmetric. Okay? So that's why it's this way. Is, is this quantum mutation only depend on the skew-symmetric form or on the original form? Uh, everything depends uh, on the original form because when you define the mutation, uh, you see that this formula depends on the original form, and that's the key point. On the other hand, the quantum torus algebra depends only on the skew symmetrized uh, variant of this form. So now, how this transformation looks like? So it's e1 prime equals minus e1, and e2 prime equals uh, e1 plus e2. Now we have to do the quantum mutation. And it works as follows. So um, we take x1 prime and we map it to psi q of x1, x1 inverse psi q of x1 inverse. And of course, nothing happens because this is just x1 inverse because all this, all this x1. But when you do a uh, transformation with x2 prime, uh, something is going to happen because you have psi q of x1. And then you have to put the corresponding, uh, the, the uh, generator corresponding to this vector, which is actually this one. And then you have to write down psi q of x1 inverse. And so the claim is that if you do a calculation, and I'm going to do this in a second, then you end up with a formula. Sorry, where this key inverse came from? Who? In, in x1. This is a, oh, I mean, if you say, look at this formula, it's, it's a definition. Yeah. So it tells you that if you take x e1 and multiply it by x e2, you're supposed to have, and uh, you're supposed to have this expression. Now, 1, 2 is minus 1, so you're supposed to have q inverse x, uh, e1 plus e2. So this is just x, e1, e2, this thing in the middle, right? Yeah, so it's, uh, uh, <laughs> I think, I think it's supposed to be, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's probably supposed to be q, but then I, so this tells me, let me see again. So it's 1, 2, so it's minus 1. Uh, what? Uh, I know it should be Q. So, mm, maybe I should, I'll do it myself, just a second. Okay. So, so, uh, <coughs> so in any case, so if you apply this transformation, so what's going, what you're going to do, you're going to take this term, let's just not worry how we normalize the definitions, uh, if you normalize this way, so I think it's fine. So, so uh, we just wanted to, uh, this term uh, going through this way. And so in the process of doing this, uh, the key point is that when you move it through here, uh, you're going to mm, pick up here something which will be psi q of q minus square x1. And then this moves here. But then there is a relation that this is 1 plus q inverse x inverse psi q of x1, which is the defining relation for the quantum dialogue. And because of that, you will see that this guy and this guy is going to be canceled in the end. And so you end up with a rational expression. So you can calculate which one, but you'll get what, uh, what I promised. So when q equals to 1, you get this class transformations we were talking about. That's it. So this shows how uh, the transformation works at one mutation. Now, what are cluster transformations? So, and again, so the main kind of uh, point here, the main remarkable thing which is happening, is that you do automorphism of the fraction field of the quantum torus algebra. And uh, like for the simple algebras, like matrix algebras, you know that any uh, automorphism is inner. But this is not quite in automorphism. It's inner in only in some strange sense because it's a conjugation. So it's kind of inner, but it's a conjugation by the element which does not belong to your algebra. So it's not inner. 
But nevertheless, <coughs> the result is still automorphism. So it's a kind of new way to produce automorphisms of quantum torus algebra. And uh, I claim that they appear here because basically there is no other ways to, uh, to produce in a reasonable way. So I don't want to formulate a statement now, but if you uh, try to construct any automorphism of quantum torus algebra, which preserves, of course, the algebra structure, and then some dual data, which is some class in K2, then uh, you're bound to consider just composition of this uh, transformations, uh, uh, like conjugations, maybe by powers of this guy. Uh, you can take a psi q of any element of your quantum torus algebra, like any monomial uh, raised to any power, and consider any kind of composition. You still have rational transformations, and the ideological, that's all you can get. And so that's no surprise that uh, you got it, because it's probably there, there's nothing else. But uh, on the other hand, uh, yes, so this is the main example, and kind of the main kind of miracle of the story is that you write down the classical transformations, and you see it's a little ugly. When you go to the quantum, you immediately see that it has much more sense. And then you write down classical by going to quasi-classical limit. And then you understand it better. So, sorry, Sasha, I didn't really understand the calculation you did here at the end. What I, didn't, I didn't do calculation uh, to the end. I just said that if you Joel, take this guy and move through this one here, then this and this not commute. They Q commute. And so if you move any function of x1 through this expression, the, what's going to happen, this is going to move through, but here you'll get uh, some coefficient of q, which depends how this and this guy q commute, okay? After that, uh, you'll have this moved here and this moved there, but then you use this uh, difference relation, okay? And difference relation will tell you that the transcendental part, I mean power series part of this formula will be canceled, and you get just a rational formula. So this is the, so to speak, kind of main point, the main uh, kind of essence of what's going on. OK, now then we can just compose them. Let's say quantum uh, cluster transformations. Uh, so we, we just want to define them to, book, to make a bookkeeping of notation. So we have some uh, uh, quiver C0. Then we mutate at the direction k1. And we have a new quiver C1, then we mutate in the direction K2 and have quiver C2, mutate direction K3, get something. Uh, in the end of the day, we get to the quiver Cm, uh, and we arrive to it by doing mutations direction Km. So this is arbitrary uh, composition of these mutations. And so let's call this I. And so now we define the corresponding cluster transformation corresponding to this sequence, just as a composition. So it's my phi from uh, C0 to C1 uh, with this K1 composed and so on, composed with phi of uh, Cm minus 1 to Cm or Km. And I already defined those, so that's the definition. But uh, if you think about this definition, this is conjugation by quantum dialogue, monomial, trans monomial transformation, conjugation by quantum dialogue, and again, monomial transformation, conjugation by quantum dialogue, and so on. But we can rewrite this slightly as doing composition first, that's a claim, a monomial transformation first, and then conjugation uh, second. So the claim is that phi of i can be written as follows. Conjugation psi q of f of x, f1. Conjugation psi q of fm. Composed with some monomial transformation, which I write as i of related uh, uh, to the sequence. So the only question uh, which remains here, of course, who is this monomial transformation? Uh, that's easy, but also who are those vectors? Because as I said, we can apply conjugation by quantum the logarithm for any vectors of the lattice. And so now I just have to specify these vectors, which makes this true. And this is more convenient because now we have compositions of uh, conjugations just uh, collected together at once. And OK, so the rule for this, those vectors is the following. So we have the original basis vectors. This is in, in this quiver. And then we do uh, this mutation, and then we get a new collection of vectors. Uh, 
And then we again do mutation and get another collection of vectors and so on. In the end of the day, we get something like that. I am. And so uh, the, the, the statement is that this vector f sub s, the one which you see here, is nothing else but the vector e chi s at the moment of time s minus 1. So you have this, you, you start with the original basis, then you transform it, transform it, transform it, transform it, and then you look at some particular moment of time s, you look at the, uh, this, this transformed basis, and you take the basis vector, actually this one is s minus 1, so it's moment of, it's after s mi minus 1 mutations. And you look basis vectors which parameterized by the index ks, which comes uh, to the next step of this mutation process. And uh, this transformation, uh, this is just a uh, composition of those uh, a monomial transformation is related to each of the individual steps, the one which is written here. Okay, so that's it. So that's a kind of... Uh, hmm? So phi of ci to cj ki is a formula that you wrote behind the board? So, so this, uh, this phi of c to c1 k1, this is a formula you just wrote behind this board? Uh, let me repeat. So, so I'm saying that by definition phi of i is this. And I explain that actually you can write it this way. What's the difference? The difference is that this is conjugation monomial, conjugation monomial transformation, so on. Now I pull back on monomial transformations to the right hand side and all conjugations to the left, it's just technically more convenient. Well, my, my question was different. It's just the definition of this phi is just behind the board, right? This? Yes, okay. This, yes. Which is what I was asking. Okay, okay. So now we wanted to come to the part which is a quantization, uh, real quantization of, uh, so, sorry, let me finish first of all with algebra. So okay, so now we have many, many quantum tori. And this quantum tori, mm, so you start with the original one, it's your quiver C, then you can do mutations in all n directions, in all unfrozen directions, you get new quivers, and so you get some other quantum tori sitting here. Original ones here, then you do mutations again. You get new quantum torus algebras. But actually, you may just think that this is the same quantum torus algebra because the letters didn't change, but you just pick up different kind of uh, generators of this algebra. So you get infinite collection of this uh, quantum torus algebra. But in order to get the definition of cluster Poisson variety, quantum cluster Poisson variety, you have to identify some of them. Because it may happen that if you start with some original quiver C and you go to some C tilde, it may happen that these quivers are actually isomorphic as quivers. Then you can identify the corresponding uh, quantum torus algebra. So you can take OQ of T C tilde and just identify it with OQ of C. Uh, in the way provided by this identification of basis. Like you take a basis, you mutate, mutate, and take a different basis, and now uh, this basis has the same brackets. It gives the same quiver, means it has the same, uh, the form has the same brackets as here. So then there is an isomorphism of these algebras. And so you can compose your composition of mutation in this one, so you end up with some transformation, okay? And so this is just some automorphism uh, of this original algebra, but it may happen that this automorphism is trivial, uh, and so this way you get this uh, trivial class transformations, but if it's non-trivial, there's some automorphism of your original, uh, of your original data, and so if it's non-trivial, then you get element of the cluster modular group, that's a definition, but if it's trivial, it's trivial, so you just don't count it. I'll give you an example in a second. So, uh, so this way, uh, if you want to do this in the quasi-classical level, when q actually 1, you specialize q equals to 1, then this way you get some uh, split tori, many of them, and it just kind of birationally identifies them. Uh, but then uh, it may happen that after some process of, of, of this birational transformations, you get to, to torus, which is as Poisson torus as a morphic to this one, then you also identify. So this is the notion of a 
uh, cluster Poisson variety. And let me just give you an example how this works in the classical level. You can just take a pentagon and uh, you can put points here. We discuss this example. And then for whatever two diagonals of this pentagon, let's call these diagonals like E1 and E2, uh, we can construct the corresponding coordinates. Like x e1, that's a general definition, so you take this four points and you consider the cross ratio of point x1, in this case x2, x3, and x4, and x e2 is going to be cross ratio of x1, x3, x4, and x5. Okay, and then you generate, let's say, quantum Poisson torus, uh, or just usual Poisson torus using these two generators, you get one chart. But you can go to a different chart if you consider different triangulation, like this one. Then you get also a pair of coordinates which are related to these ones using precisely the transformation we were talking uh, before. Actually, it's just this example. But then you can mutate it one more time, and this time uh, you get this uh, pair of coordinates. Then you can mutate it one more time, and this time you get something like this. And then finally, in the end of the day, you return to the previous picture. Let me erase this definition, because we had it before. And so you get the fifth pentagon. And so this is, so it now is this way. And then uh, you mutate it here, you get this one. So if you consider composition of five uh, uh, transformations, just formal transformation on coordinates, then you will see that the result will be an identity map. And this is consistent with the fact that these formal transformations, they are not just formal transformations, but they record how this coordinate, uh, how this coordinate transforms via this coordinate. So geometrically, it's clear that if you consider this composition five times, you get an identity map. But from the formal point of view, what you do, uh, you consider the original quiver, then you mutate, you can mutate in two directions, and so on so far. But the point is that if you consider this kind of sequence of mutations, and you also apply uh, some, you, you relabel this uh, variables each time, uh, then if you do this, then you get uh, precisely the original pair. If you don't relabel, you have to do this twice. So uh, it's a composition of this class transformation and relabeling of the variables. And so that's a typical situation how we get uh, the, map, the, the cluster modular group. So in this case, this map is element, in this case, cluster modular group. is isomorphic to Z mod 5Z. And it's generated by, by this uh, change of variables. Uh, combined with uh, renaming uh, first diagonal as a second, second as a first. But when you consider five transformations like that, you get identity. So the mapping class group is Z mod 5Z. And so the, you can kind of adjust to the general definition, just keeping this example in, in mind. Okay? So, uh, and if you want to get cluster Poisson variety, you just glue five C squares using these transformations, and you get some two-dimensional space. All right. So, but what we wanted to do, why we uh, like this uh, structure, because we, uh, is because we want to quantize it. And quantize, I would say, in real sense. I mean, quantize in, in the sense of producing operators in Hilbert space, and so on so far. And so let's just move into this direction. Uh, to explain what we are going to do, uh, just remind you that on the first lecture, we were talking about quantization of uh, cluster Poisson Tori, and we ended up with understanding that you can assign to each quantum Poisson Tori functions and L2 of R with the action of the corresponding quantum torus. Actually, it's modular double. And so we had five unitary operators, which actually is the same kind of operator. And it's, uh, the, the main statement is that its fifth uh, power equals to uh, some constant times the identity map. So, but what we did, we started with uh, cluster Poisson torus, quantized this using Bailey representation, got the Hilbert space, 
And then what we are going to do now, I said we did, but we didn't. We want to construct some unitary operator which uh, relates this Hilbert spaces. This is this, so constructing this Hilbert space, this is, as I explained, just value representation construction. But constructing this unitary operator, this is a key point. This is a kind of nonlinear value presentation which we wanted to get. So let me get to this point. Okay, so after this kind of preparation, let me do it. And so the first question is, uh, mm, uh, so how to proceed there? So mm, let me recall what we did basically on the first lecture, that you have this uh, Heisenberg uh, uh, group related uh, to lattice uh, mm, mm, and, uh, uh, and the form. And actually, uh, I now wanted to consider the Heisenberg Lie algebra. So this is, for now, it's Heisenberg Lie algebra. Uh, and so what is heisenberg lie algebra? It's extension mm, lambda heisenberg lambda. And then here you have just some central element. Uh, and so you can tensor this with R to get vector spaces. Now to any, but I really need just the lattice, to any vector P uh, in this Heisenberg uh, algebra, oh, sorry, in lambda, uh, I can associate its lift to Heisenberg Lie algebra. And then the standard Heisenberg formula that this lifts uh, commute now non trivially, it's 2 pi i pi 1 pi 2 times this identity. So that's a recollection uh, about the Heisenberg Lie algebras. But then uh, what we did, we said that we wanted to consider the quantum torus algebra related to T lambda. We wanted to tensor it with the quantum torus algebra for Q check related to T lambda. And uh, I remind you that this Q, now Sasha's question, now it's a number i pi h and Q check is exponent i pi divided by h. So we have this tensor product. Q and Q check are numbers now. And so we call this a sub h uh, of t lambda, or just a sub h. And uh, mm, then this a sub h uh, is generated, you can say, is generated by the two pairs of variables, so it's variable x sub p, p is the element of your lattice, which is just exponent of beta p hat, and y sub p, which is just exponent of beta divide, uh, sorry, uh, p, uh, p hat divided by b. So uh, as we did in the first lecture, you can check that these two operators commute. with, uh, between the, I mean, axis commutes with y's, but they do not commute between themselves, so this gives, a, uh, this generates OQ of T lambda, and this, beta is a number, sorry, I said this in the first lecture. Beta, right now, just some complex number, okay? And so, and this generate uh, OQ check of T lambda, and beta related to h by the formula that h is beta squared, okay? Okay, so this modular, quantum modular double algebra, uh, you can think about this way. And so now if you have any representation of the Heisenberg algebra, you got representation of your, of your modular double just by those formulas, okay? Sorry, it seems, so in OQ and T lambda, you just had generators corresponding to lambda. Now you rescale them by complex numbers? Yes, I rescale them by complex numbers, and they still correspond, they still correspond to some, uh, any vector of lambda. But now they, uh, they commute uh, by Q, Q to something. Ah, so you fix beta. You yes, 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 I fix beta. Beta is a given number. 
Yes, 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 yes. But in the uh, in the first lecture, lambda was just C two, and then the two generators of this quantum torus, one of them was a translation, and one of them was a. Okay, okay. So, so what Joel said uh, correctly is that in the first, uh, correct, in the first lecture, lambda was just Z2, so this was an example. Now lambda is anything. Secondly, uh, it's a very good comment. So in the first lecture, we had a very concrete way to write down the Heisenberg representation. It was translation by 2 pi i and multiplication by exponent of t. And then when we do this trick, multiply by beta and divide by beta, we get translation by 2 pi i beta and 2 pi i divided by beta, and multiplication by e to t beta and e to t divided by beta. That's exactly the formulas we had. So they depend on the original input, which is which of the realization of the Heisenberg representation you take. OK? And so let me just repeat what. Uh, just said because just need this for keeping. So let me remind you how the Heisberg representation works. So let's assume first. Uh, this uh, form is not degenerate. Then uh, we pick some decomposition of lambda into some L plus L prime, where well, these guys are just Lagrangian subspaces for the form. And then uh, this uh, allows us to construct star representation of the algebra we care about, AH of t lambda, and uh, it acts in L2 of uh, this L tensor R in this vector space. It's just half of the lattice. And it acts in a very standard way. So vector L in this L goes for t to 2 pi i L, and then uh, we are scaled by t to 2 pi i beta L or t to 2 pi i uh, divided by beta L if you wanted to go to the presentation of H. But the, the original thing is how you construct the Heisenberg representation this way. And then if you take any vector called L star from the uh, second Lagrangian subspace, then it goes to a multiplication uh, by, so you, you can consider the corresponding linear functional. Uh, and uh, if you construct the group representation, they take it ex exponent. So, so anyway, so this way you get the presentation of the Heisenberg-Lie algebra. Okay. So what's important to take home is that it depends on the choice of polarization, choice of the decomposition in L and L prime, and when you change, you have to do some transformation. And Andre will explain how to do that. So we got this uh, representation of H in general, and now. Uh, in the case of this is usually this is, this is more or less what is usually considered in the theory of non commutative torus, right? This is this bimodule over one torus and another torus, corresponding to parameters h and other I, I don't know what it means usually, but this is the representation of this AH of the modular double, and that's what it is. It's, it's a well known construction. So, in general, I wanted to say that we have now kernel. Uh, of our bilinear form. And therefore, uh, we get a projection from the Poisson torus to the one related to the kernel. And so this describes uh, uh, the uh, uh, Poisson structures of fibrous asymplectic leaves. And so now we can write down that H lambda, now in this case will be semiforms on. Uh, this t lambda zero of r plus uh, these values in Hilbert space, uh, which we already defined, which is as, uh, the one uh, assigned to the fiber. Mm. So 
if you call this map mu to let's say mu inverse of zero. So we get just semi, semi form of the base with values in the Hilbert space which you see fiber wise. And then the main claim is uh, that this H lambda is of course integral of some uh, more elementary Hilbert spaces over lambda. And the important thing here is that lambda belongs only to uh, points of uh, this uh, torus with values and positive numbers. That's the spectral decomposition. That's the classical stuff. OK, now we're done again. So we assigned to, uh, to the quiver some Hilbert space. And we understand that this means that this Hilbert space actually depends how we realize this, how we take this decomposition element on prime. And if you take a different one, you have to put intertwiner into the game. So when I said that any transformation is obtained by conjugation by quantum dialogues, I mean quantum dialogues, they are powers or monomial transformations. So this is what you do if you have monomial transformation. Now let's do the main step. So far it was uh, rather trivial preparations. A definition. We wanted to say how we relate these Hilbert spaces if they're assigned to different quivers. And so given a mutation, there was a question? No? Mutation uh, from C to C prime in the direction K, uh, we define an intertwiner And so this is an operator, k, which you know from c to c prime somehow relates to c and c prime, I would say, and this k. And so we define this as a composition of two, just as we did with the notion of cluster transformation. So it's a composition of two operators, and they go from the Hilbert space, which we just assigned to c prime, following uh, Heisenberg and Weyl, to Hilbert space assigned to C. Well, this is the main point. So we have now two different uh, quivers, and they are related by mutation. And we want to construct unitary transformation, which identifies this Hilbert spaces canonically uh, in a way that it, in some sense, has to be explained, commutes with the algebras acting here and here, equivariant on the action of those algebras. So uh, OK. So here is the definition, which will be a little bit cryptic because I'll have to define the main player. And so uh, you say the following, that OK, you have uh, the PK hat. This is a uh, Heisenberg operator, which corresponds uh, to a base vector EK. We do mutations the base vector EK. And so before, when we're doing algebra, you're saying, OK, let's take psi q of x e k, and let's conjugate by this. Now, uh, we cannot do something like that, because uh, the problem is that this series is divergent if absolute value of q, uh, I would say, divergent unless absolute value of q is less than 1. And if you remember, we actually wanted to have a story which makes sense when absolute value of q equals to 1. So we cannot use at all this transformation. It doesn't make sense to us when q is actual number, unitary number. And so what we say, we say that we apply some function, which depends on beta, to this operator, which is actually self-adjoint operator under some assumptions, if uh, beta is real or absolute value of beta is 1. So we will talk about this uh, later on. But uh, we, wanted, uh, we wanted to find some nice function which replaces the quantum dialogue and which is going to give us, maybe I'm going to erase this now, give us a map from HC to HC. And I still have to tell you what this function is, it's the main point. And the other part of the story is completely trivial. So the second operator is the quantization of the monomial part of the transformation. And this is just an isomorphism, hc prime to hc. 
uh, uh, isomorphism induced by uh, basis mutation. H Hilbert space related to C is a Hilbert space which we assign following Heisenberg and Andre Weil to the quiver Q using some polarization, some decomposition. So you have to understand that this is not just some L2, it's many, many L2 related by canonical isomorphism. It's not completely canonical if you, you know, it's a metaplectic representation, not symplectic. But we keep this as a block and say, okay, this is a Hilbert space. Now this is entirely different story. It's entirely different Hilbert space, which corresponds to a nonlinear change of variables. And so what we want to do, we want to quantize this nonlinear change of variables. And the main point is that, yes, we can do it. How we can do it? So the first uh, attempt would be to use this function quantum dialogram, which we use for conjugation. But this cannot work. So we have to uh, end up with some more clever device how to do this. And here's how it goes. So that's where actually the quantum dialogram actually appears. The, the actual one, I would say. Not the power series version. So we consider the following function. So phi beta of z is defined as follows. So we take the power series psi q of e to beta z and divide it by psi 1 over q check. It's a modular transformation of an exponent of z divided by beta. And now you can complain that this makes sense only when absolute value of q is less than 1. Because this makes sense only when absolute value of q less than 1. And this makes sense only if absolute value of q less than 1. But remarkably, uh, if you take the ratio, then you can write this as exponent of some integral. And it makes sense for any q. This is integral over 0 of e to i pi z divided by uh, sinus hyperbolic of pi p beta inverse and sinus hyperbolic of pi b zeta dp over p. And so this function is well defined. Uh, for example, it's well defined if beta is real or beta has absolute value 1. And that's where the exponent will be has absolute value 1 or even something else. So it's, it's actually defined for all betters. And so this is the function we wanted to play with. So this is a quantum dialogue And it has the property that if, basically, that phi beta of z bar is uh, phi beta uh, of z bar uh, but basically, what you wanted to say, you don't even need this. So we need just to say that uh, if beta is a real number, or absolute beta, a value of beta is 1, let's say that for now beta is not plus minus i, then the absolute value of phi beta of z is just 1. This means that in the regime we really care about, for example, beta is real, means that h is positive. So our function is not only well-defined, but it's also unitary. It takes uh, values of absolute, uh, their numbers of absolute value 1. So z is the real value? Uh, z, so far, z can be any variable, as you can see in this formula. But in a moment, we are going to substitute the self-adjoint operator into this formula. And then, uh, if beta is real, it will be real. If OK? So we, we're just going to use this formula. So, but pk is a self-adjoint operator under the assumptions. That's exactly where the assumptions were coming from. Is it beta c or beta p in the denominator? Uh, uh, it's p, 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 of course. I'm sorry. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, there is no, there is no uh, z involved in any kind of integration. It just stands as a parameter. Integration over p. Thank you. And this function has beautiful properties that it does satisfy two different equations. You can shift by 2 pi beta, or as usual, you can shift 
by 2 pi i divided by beta. And in this case, you get 1 plus q a check exponent of z divided by beta multiplied by phi beta of z. So that's a key point about this function. It's unitary when, it's, when we need it, and it satisfies two uh, different equations related to beta and beta inverse. All right, so after this, we are basically done, because after this, uh, my uh, intertwiner is defined. So I can define for any mutation, and more generally, I can compose them. So wait, uh, so why is it an intertwiner? I, I didn't say in what sense it's intertwined. I said this in the first lecture, but didn't say this right now. It's actually uh, very. Uh, I thought with respect to this algebra A, right? No? Yeah, yeah. Just a second. Just a second. Just a second. So I'm just saying that I got an I got an operator. Okay. Now this operator, in some sense, quantizes this nonlinear transformation. And so, in what sense it quantizes this nonlinear transformation? So, uh, but before I go there, I just want to formulate a statement. So. Uh, so let me just do it, sir. So more generally, uh, uh, any uh, cluster Poisson transformation um, called, uh, I don't know, we use already C. Let's call it kappa from C to C prime. So it's a composition of many mutations. Uh, gives rise to the corresponding uh, intertwiner, which goes from the Hilbert space assigned to C prime to Hilbert space assigned to C. So we just compose those elementary transformations. Sorry, when you define K prime, do you kind of have some compatible polarizations? No, 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 no. I, I don't have to. So this is. This is taken care of by previous discussion. Once again, if I have a quantum torus, which means lattice with bilinear form, let's say symplectic, then there are many, 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 infinitely many Hilbert space I can produce that corresponds to polarizations. Okay? If you choose one of them here and one of them there, I produce some unitary operator. If you choose a different one here, I will precompose it with this isomorphism and then uh, use the isomorphism which I have. So I have infinitely many operators, so to speak, which uh, each corresponds to a pair of uh, Lagrangians here and here. For each choice of polarization? Yes, and I don't say this. Absolutely. And I don't say this because the presentation will be too heavy. I'm just saying that uh, you have to understand that the Hilbert space means not one concrete Hilbert space, but infinitely many of them, and they are related by canonical unit transformations. And for any choice of this one and this one, there is a unit transformation, and they are compatible. So what can you explain <coughs> then the definition of K prime? I just said, but uh, 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 so what this uh, transformation does, uh, it tells you that uh, basically uh, you have some monomial transformation. And so you have this some monomial transformation, and if you happen to write down the first one in using certain bases, then you kind of tilt it after this. So you have to do something so about it. You have to use intertwining operators of value. For value presentation, yes. That's what it does. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, 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 exactly. So that's very uh, trivial, and this is the only point. OK, now what is the statement? Uh, so we wanted to say that this uh, uh, unitary operator commutes with the representations of those algebras, but this uh, statement on the nose doesn't make any sense whatsoever because uh, this, uh, uh, this operates this our algebra x by non-bounded operators, and you can't really say that, I mean, this is kind of warning, if you have some transformation like you have x and y, and x goes to, let's say, x inverse, and y goes to something like y times 1 plus qx inverse inverse, something like that. So, and you call this x prime and y prime. So what we wanted to say, we want to say that when we, uh, that, uh, we have this unit transformation, and so if you apply x first and k second, then you get x, you know, call it x, y, let's do it with y. Then you get y prime k. You want to say that we have this formula, but this formula makes no sense. 
because you have to deal with this uh, inverse of 1 plus x of something, you can define this operator, no problem. But you in order to make this formula to be true, you have to specify some vectors in your Hilbert space on which uh, this operator can be applied. And after this unit transformation, this operator can be applied. And that's, of course, a uh, very complicated issue. And so it's not visible how to do this. And so if you just say this is true for any vectors in the Hilbert space, this is plain wrong, because this makes no sense, this makes no sense. So we have to worry about some domain where all these operators are actually defined. And so here's uh, what is going on. That's, there is a theorem, it's main theorem, that first of all, before I go there, Let's make notation. So x is this original cluster Poisson variety. And uh, we created this uh, quantum modular double. I remind you, it's tensor product of OQX, tensor OQ of x. Uh, actually, have to take language doll here. And what is this guy? I didn't quite define this. So I need to do this now. So definition. Uh, we define this OQ of X as follows. We say that F uh, belongs to OQ of X if for any uh, cluster Poisson uh, coordinate system C, which comes with coordinates x1 and so on, x and C, uh, this F is a Laurent polynomial in uh, this variables x1 and so on, xn with coefficient in z of q, q inverse, you can put actually positive integers if you want. You can consider variance. But the most important property is that uh, you do the following. So you have your uh, cluster Poisson guy, and so it glues from infinitely many tori or finitely many tori. You take one of the torus, it's a quantum torus, and you consider the algebra of Laurent polynomials on this quantum torus. Very good. Then I go to a different coordinate system, and some of those Laurent polynomials may become not Laurent polynomials. Then you throw them away, and you keep only those which remain Laurent polynomials after the first mutation, and after the second, and after all mutations. And so a priori it's not clear that you have a single element except constant in this algebra. It's very easy to see that at least the center of this algebra is there, that if you have the center of the form on lambda, then you can get some center of this algebra. But if lambda is not degenerate, nobody a priori guarantees you that you have elements because you have infinitely many conditions on them. That's number one. But we have to deal with this algebra, and we take it quantum modular double, and then uh, so should be Q check here, this is Q check. Oh, I didn't write this. This is Q check. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so what's the X check? Is it uh, so X check uh, is a Langlands dual quiver. I didn't tell you what it is, and so let me not do this for now. Okay. But it's important here, but let me skip it. So, mm, mm, so uh, first of all, uh, mm, uh, there is a subspace, uh, which is called S, uh, a sub C, uh, in the Hilbert space HC for each. Uh, uh, quiver C such that uh, the algebra uh, mm, uh, A H of A acts on this subspace. So for each quiver, I can find some uh, domain of definition for all those operators which I care about, which forms the algebra, the modular double of the algebra functions on my cluster Poisson variety. So again, I defined this guy, this algebra. I didn't, uh, as I said, it could be very small, but still I define it. And now I consider 
uh, I claim that there are some natural subspaces in my Hilbert spaces where all unbounded operators from this algebra can be actually applied and the result will be still sitting in the L2, which do not take you outside of L2. And so, and now the main statement is that uh, the intertwiners uh, KC0 induces an isomorphism of these uh, Schwartz type spaces. Uh, first item is the kind of density condition or what? Is there are some conditions. So first of all, is definitely uh, this subspace is definitely the stainless is definitely dense with respect to the Hilbert metric here in, in this space. So it's big enough. That's number one. But more than that, I'll, I'm about to go to there. Without something like this, the assertion is stable. We can take zero substance. Wait a second. So I'm going to list the properties. There exist subspaces with some, with some properties. And so, so first of all, the algebra x, you can add it as c is dense uh, in hc. Uh, this uh, space has a definition. It's not just some subspace. This is z domain of the definition for this algebra. It consists of all vectors in the Hilbert space. This has a property that if, uh, uh, if you apply, uh, that, that you can apply operators from your algebra to these vectors, and you're still sitting in the Hilbert space, OK? It's like if you consider instead of the algebra AH, if you consider the algebra of polynomial differential operators, that's the definition of the Schwartz space. It's all infinitely smooth functions which decay faster than any polynomial. Yeah, smooth vectors. In this yes, yes, yes. This means that you can apply any element of this algebra, and you're still in L2. So that's the definition of the space. So this is the space. The claim is that it's big enough, that it's dense. And that intertwiner, in, we talked about this there. Oh, it was kappa, sorry. Thanks. Kappa is any cluster transformation, that one. So it defines a map from the Schwartz type space assigned to C prime to Schwartz type space state to C, and that's an isomorphism. And the main point is in what sense it commutes. That if you take this cup K of kappa 0, and you take some vector, let's call it vector S in the Schwartz space, and you apply some element of your algebra, this belongs to A sub H of X, uh, then what you get is K kappa 0 of S uh, applied to gamma C0 of A acting here. And uh, so now I have to put quantum. So first of all, this is true for any for any A in A H. And gamma uh, is the action uh, of my nonlinear transformation. So this is a, basically the cluster transformation. Uh, and so the statement is, I mean, not that they literally commute. You know that you can pull A here, but when you pull it, you're picking up. Uh, it's, it's intertwined by the action of the, of the, of the uh, quantum class transformation. So that's the main point. So it commutes in this sense. So I emphasize once again that this is definitely what we wanted to have, but we absolutely cannot have it and absolutely cannot state it in the situation uh, when, first of all, S is any vector from H2, it makes no sense. Secondly, we have to be very careful to put commutation, uh, commuting conditions, intertwining conditions for which element of the algebra. So if we consider not algebra AH, which is basically the algebra of this universal Laurent polynomials, but if we uh, put into the game any kind of element which has denominator, we are immediately dead. So we cannot do anything, we cannot prove anything, there's no statement, there's nothing. So the only algebra which allows us to put this condition is the algebra of this universally Laurent polynomials, which is the algebra of regular functions, this quantum cluster variety. And that's the only kind of uh, conditions we can write down. So once and once again, we absolutely cannot write down this condition uh, if you have some kind of transformation which has denominators. And so the literature is full of statements that we impose something like that condition and prove wonderful theorems. And they, this is completely wrong and uh, has to be unfortunately ignored. Can we assume that beta we had before is real, right? Uh, real or absolute value beta right. is one. 
Yes. And this was. Uh, who, who are the unitary? You, you, say huh? some, you say that some of these operators are unitary. They're all unitary. This is K. They're all unitary. If beta is uh, has absolute value one, or beta is real. And the, the cluster variables are they unitary? <laughs> no, they're self-adjoint. Self yes, cluster variables are self-adjoint, and the intertwiners are unitary operators uh, which transform. Uh, you know, the, the, this nonlinear action. But I emphasize again, you absolutely cannot say that you take a cluster, there is this cluster variable. You absolutely cannot say that your transformation uh, commutes with the action of the cluster variable because most of the cluster variables has a property that if you apply any class transformation to them, then you get denominators like one plus y in the denominator. As soon as you get denominators, you cannot say anything, you, you cannot prove anything, there is no statements. So this means that you don't really make claims about cluster variables, you make claims about some Laurent polynomials which turns out to be regular functions on your manifolds, but your variables very rarely belong to this class. And so uh, that's a, this, is, this is the correct way to state this. And so this is a theorem, this is a non-trivial theorem. I mean, it's non-trivial. Mm. Uh, so I didn't actually even formulate it completely. So this is this intertwiners. And so all this is equivariant with respect to the cluster modular group. Now I want to explain what do I mean here. So if you happen to have some sequence of cluster transformations, like here you have some sequence of uh, cluster transformations, which is the same cluster transformation basically with this little symmetry, such that if you take uh, it five times, you get the identity transformation. Then uh, a priori nobody guarantees that if you apply the sequence of your quantized unitary transformations, you get identity or actually multiple of the identity, scalar multiple of the identity. It, it shouldn't be identity. So nobody guarantees this. And it's a quite, quite very non-trivial theorem that actually this does happen. And so uh, it doesn't follow immediately from any kind of properties that it commutes with the action of the algebra. You have to be careful again here. But it's true. It's a non-trivial fact. And proving it, it indeed uses full force of this, you know, working with this Schwarz spaces and this algebra and so on and so far. And so in the end of the day, we do get the statement that it is equivalent on the action of the mapping class group. And what it really means is that if you happen to have sequence of class transformations which is trivial, sequence of quantized unitary class transformations, which is sequence of this unitary intertwiners, will be almost trivial. It will be a multiple of, of identity operator. So this is kind of generalized pentagon relation, and this is a very essential part of this theory. So now that's it. So I stated the main result. So I explained what is cluster Poisson variety. So how it can be quantized, how it leads to uh, some Hilbert spaces related by this unitary intertwiners, that we get this Schwartz spaces. And one more comment here, that this uh, S sub C has a natural structure of so-called Frechet space, which means, uh, in simple words, that it has different topology. We don't use topology on S, which is induced from the, topo from the topology on the Hilbert space. It's like in the usual uh, Schwartz space, when we consider generalized functions, we don't take functions which are continuous with respect to L2 norm. We take functions which are, uh, you know, convergent with all derivatives and so on and so far. So we have to do it here, and the correct way is to say that the, all the semi-norms, uh, this is Hilbert norm, and this A belongs to A sub H of X. So we have to consider all the semi-norms and the topology induced by the semi-norms. That's what Frechet space means. So this is topology like in the space of uh, classical Schwarz space, but now it uses our algebra. Algebra of regular functions, I insist again, on, on this cluster Poisson variety, which is n look of the algebra of polynomial differential operators on the line. And uh, we can now define the space of distributions. Yeah. So, so part of the theorem is also that uh, OQ of X and AHR of X is, is not trivial, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's part of that, uh, but yes. But actually, it, it, even if OQ of X is small, there is some kind of tricks how to make all this true. It's true for any cluster Poisson variety, in spite of the fact that in some exceptional cases, it could be smaller than you might think. 
So it's a good point. But so now we, we can introduce the space S dual, which is just the continuous. dual to S for its uh, Frechet topology. OK, so now we basically constructed our main working horse. This is we quantized this cluster post on varieties. And the rest of the lectures, like today and the next lecture, is kind of downhill. We're going to have all the applications. Because now I got the data, which was announced in the first lecture. I said that we are going to have triple of spaces. So now we have them, and we're going to have mapping class group acting on them, and we're going to get this algebra also acting on them. Now we have all this data which was in the first lecture. So I'm going to do a break now, like for, I don't know, 10 minutes. And after this, after the break, I'm going to talk about the main example. The, I'm going to explain that the model space of uh, this, this model space we introduced, which relates to a group G, uh, split a joint. Uh, some simple group G and any decorated surface S does have the structure and therefore is quantizable and therefore produce all this kind of representation. So I'm going to remind you what the space is and then uh, explain how to construct this structure there and therefore quantize and get all the applications which we'll discuss today in the next lecture. So once again, so if you some kind of vain jet lag or oversleep for another uh, legitimate reasons, uh, all this discussion, that's completely okay. So what you have to take out from here is that there exists a way to quantize it, and we are going to use it, and we are going to produce uh, on kind of model spaces we are looking for, we are going to produce the structures, and therefore use this kind of device quantize. Okay, to uh, 350 on my uh, break. Uh, with Volodya fork, and it's long ago, it's uh, 2003, and complete some one more paper to 007. This is minus part absolute beta equal one story, but okay, I mean, everything else is, is from there. Now, now I emphasize this is joint work with Link Hui Shen from. Uh, University of Michigan at Lansing. And uh, this is reason. So this is like 19 something in the archive, 19 or 4 something. Okay, so let me proceed to this. So, what are the key features? The first question is what are the key features of the modeling? space PGS. And again, there are some new listeners here, so I'll briefly remind you what we're talking about. So we have a decorated surface, which means that we have a surface which has boundary. And on each boundary component, by default, we have at least one special point, maybe more, but finitely many. And in addition to this, we have punctures. And they, they together, we can call them marked points. And so here is the surface. Now we put some data. So first of all, so we have this model space PGS. So it parameterizes, remind you, that this PGS uh, parameterizes as triples L beta P. And so L is just G local system, as usual, on the surface S. So it's 2D data. So, I mean, it's better to think about this as a kind of data given to you in 2D, 1D, and 0D. So in 2D, you have topological data, G-local system. Now, this 1D is what you see between these red points, and you see it on the boundary, and this is this notion of pinning. And I'll remind you what this in a second, but you put on boundary intervals some kind of data. And 0D data, you put add punches and at red points. So zero D data is just what was called previously framing, which means invariant flag uh, near mark points. I kind of very quickly write this down, but I remind you that you have to have, you have to uh, restrict your local system 
in the neighborhood of the puncture at, uh, of the puncture, and you have to consider the corresponding local system of flags and take invariant section. You can just say that this is just invariant flag. This means if you go monodromy, you get the same flag. And this is uh, for generic local system, just W and factorial for PGLM choices. So when you take local system, you exclude the punctures? Yes. And uh, another data of this framing means that you put some flags here, like B1, B2. So you put some flags there. But besides these flags, the spinning, which is the main kind of new hero, you put here, pinning means the following, that here you put some decorated flag, let's call it A1 and A2, such that the so-called H distance between them is 1. So I explained in the previous lectures what H distance is. And the point is that there is a map H from the space A cross A divided by G to the Cartan group. And so uh, if you take this H map for the pair of decorated flags sitting there, it's 1. And the group G is adjoint. It has no center. Center of G is trivial. No center means trivial center. So that's the data. So uh, is that clear? Or should I repeat? Uh, what is H, little h? Cartan. Z Cartan. Ah, it's just name for the map. What? So, I mean, I defined this map. I'm not going to do it. But you can, OK, so you can define this very quickly. You can just say that this, of course, is the same as G divided by u and u. And this is, and you use Briard decomposition. And you write down this w, h, u, and u. And this is h to take. And this is some specific lift of the very group to the group, and so on. Some natural invariant, which is canonical, and for the adjoint group, symmetric with respect to the permutation. All right. So I'm a bit confused by you have beta 1, beta 2, a1, and a2 there. Yes, yes, yes. So the point is, OK, let's look what do we have for the triangle. We will have this anyway, so let's just repeat. For the triangle, we have no local system whatsoever. It's trivial. But we still have flags. And so we have to put three flags, which means three Borel sub subgroups here, B1, B2, and B3. And on the top of that, you have to put the six uh, decorated flags. So we can call them A1 minus, A1 plus, A2 minus, A2 plus, oh, sorry, it's A3, and A2 to minus a2 plus. So we have six decorated flags, but there is a condition on them. And of course, these flags are just lifts of uh, this flag b2. They project to it. Okay? There is a canonical projection from g mod u, which is called the principal affine space, to g mod b, which is called the flag variety. And so these two elements of principal affine space go here. These guys go here, and so on. But what is most important for us is that there is this h distance here, and it's 1. Here it's also 1, and here it's also 1. This is the definition that you use, and this is the correct definition. OK? All right. So now, what is the property of this modular spaces? So the main thing is that there are many uh, functions and many groups which act in this modular space. And so let me prepare the soil for the introduction. So first of all, we have Z Cartan group. And we also consider it's some kind of quotient, which is Z Cartan group divided. Uh, we take coinvariance of the involution, which takes this to W0 of H inverse. This is my H star. Secondly, we have the braid group. Uh, for the Dinkin diagram of G. And uh, mm, I hope you remember the definition. So it's generated by uh, simple reflections as one so on as R, which corresponds to simple roots. So R is as many as elements as simple positive roots. And it has braid relations. Namely, you have SI, SJ equals SJ. Si is a Cartan matrix between this i and j is 0. 
then you have SI, SJ, SI equals SJ, SI, SJ. If CIJ equals CJY equals minus one, and so on, meaning that you have identity CI, CJ square equals CJ, CI squared. When you have two there, more precisely, if CIJ equals two, uh, CJI equals minus two, and similarly you have for G two SI SJ cube equals SJ SI cube. Okay, there is this, this group, and now uh, there is a map, mu, a set theoretic map, from the veil group to the braid group, and it has a property that mu of s s prime is mu of s times mu s prime uh, if the length of s s prime is the sum of the lengths of s and s prime, uh, and now the important for us definition is that we have some kind of variant of the braid group BG star, which consists of all elements, let's call this X, of the braid group, uh, which has the property that they commute with their mu of longest element W0. All right. And so now we can uh, use this uh, in order to introduce the following notation. So for each uh, boundary component, pi uh, of s, uh, we have uh, the corresponding flavor of the braid group, so I call it bj pi. So this is, you can write this as a single formula, this is, okay, let me just write it without deciphering what it is. It's sometimes bg, the whole braid group, and sometimes uh, the centralizer of mu of w0. And so this is the case if the number of marked points is even, and this is the case if the number of marked points is odd. All right. This is the braid, the, the flavor of the braid group assigned to the boundary component, and also there is the flavor of the Cartan group, which is H divided by this kind of involution, but uh, taken to the power given by the number of uh, uh, special points, so this is either H or H star. The H star is the one which I defined there. And so if H is dp is even, and as H star is dp is odd. All right, that's the data which you assign to the created surface. Braid group to each boundary component, and also you have versions of the Cartan group. Now comes uh, the main theorem which tells you what the features of this model space PGS. For, so for those people who were not here on the first and second lecture, this model PGS is a kind of a true analog of the model space of local systems on a surface which has punctures and boundary points. So if surface has no punctures, no boundary points, we just consider plain local system. But if you do have some extra data in 1D on 2D, we have to, uh, it's, it's a good idea to move to this model space, which I claim is the, is the right choice. So theorem A says that the model space PGS has uh, the following features. Well, these features are kind of stratified by the geometry of the surface. And so for each puncture, P, we have the following extra data. First of all, there is W group acts on this model PGS, birationally. 
And secondly, uh, there is a canonical uh, W equivariant map, uh, let's call it mu sub p, relate to the puncture from the modulus space PGS to the Cartan group. Now, uh, let me put here somehow something like constructions. So near the punctures, you have usual flags, you have this general kind of No, no, near the puncture, you have the usual flags, usual. and near the red points, the special points, you have not only the usual flags, but you have the left and right lift to the decorated flags. Okay. And so if you do have a flag near the puncture, and monodromy of your local system is generic, then monodromy is a generic conjugacy class, so you take a regular conjugacy class, and there are exactly W of Borel subgroups which uh, uh, contains this uh, conjugacy class, exactly W. And so if you have, and this space of Borel subgroups is a principal homogeneous W space. That's where the action's coming. So the action just changing from one Borel to the other, okay? Now, what is a canonical projection? So this is a construction. So A, one A, I claim that W acts on the set of Borel subgroup uh, containing generic regular element. That's, a ju that's a just a fact. And now take the monodromy around uh, the sponge P. So then you get uh, the data which you need to get the section of W by changing. It's like you have eigenvalues and they're all different, then you can just permute them. That's very simple. That's how W is. But do you require in your model space that the, the monodromy is generic? Or? No, 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 no. I don't require. But the generic point you have, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I'm just saying that I, uh, you, you, mo you may concentrate to generic part. So that's how it acts on generic part. Now, if you talk about local systems, Monodromy goes to H divided by W. But in the presence of invariant flag, it goes monodromy, kind of corrected monodromy, goes precisely to H. So that's where this part comes from. OK. Now, the next thing is B, uh, so, sorry, part two, that for each special point, S, uh, we have the following. So first of all, we have canonical uh, potential functions uh, and so this is the functions uh, omega Si which corresponds to positive simple roots which are regular functions on this modulus space. And so I is just the set of vertices of the Dinkin diagram. And secondly, we have a canonical projection called Rosa Bess from the model space PGS to Cartan. And so I wanted to stress from the very beginning that there is some kind of similarity between this data. So it's one, two, one, two. Projection to Cartan, projection to Cartan. Here you don't see a priori any relation, but it exists. Uh, okay, this is for the special points. Now, for every boundary component, what? Uh, it's not that trivial to say this in one word. So uh, you will see it. So for each uh, boundary component uh, pi of S, uh, we have the following data. So first of all, again, 
there's this discrete symmetry. So the corresponding variant of the braid group acts on PGS. And B, there is a projection we call it mu related to boundary component from the modulus space PGS to the corresponding flavor of the Cartan group related to this puncture. So here we use this data which you see upstairs. And again, there is a parallel. There is on the bottom, you always have projection to Cartan. And on the top of all this, uh, uh, we have the following, which kind of data four. So sorry, d pi is just a number of special points on the boundary, right? Huh? d pi is just a number of special points. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So it's not the end of the theorem, just part four, that the discrete group, uh, which I call the group gamma gs, uh, which is by definition the following group. You take the group of auto automorphism of the group G. It always has at least two elements, which you can produce. Then you take a product uh, with a mapping class group. And then you take semi-direct product of this guy uh, with the following group. You take the product of the wave groups over the punctures and the product of the appropriate uh, flavor of the braid group over the boundary components. And so the claim is that this group acts on PGS. And now this is clear from what I said because I already introduced the action of the braid. I already say that I have the action of the braid groups in part three, veil groups in the part one. I certainly have the action of the mapping class group because everything is natural with respect to automorphism of the topological surface. And I definitely have automorphism, automorphism of the group G acting on the whole story. It's also clear. So uh, the only kind of extra data which the statement for uh, adds that the action of the veil group at different punctures commute. That's clear by definition. That the action of the braid groups of the different uh, components commute. This is, I didn't give you the definition, so we cannot argue about this. That the action of the veil group and braid group commute. Well, they are far away punctures and special points. And that basically the other groups commute with them. To be precise, the mapping class group can permute, uh, for example, punctures, and that's why I put the semi-direct product. But other than that, uh, they're kind of independent. So we have semi-direct product acting. Okay, so we have this data. And, uh, of course, there is a main theorem about this. The main theorem is that uh, this modulus space has a cluster Poisson structure which has all these properties and all the symmetries. Uh, but let me start with just a part of the main statement was the theorem B. Uh, the moduli space uh, PGS has uh, a, this gamma GS equivariant Uh, cluster Poisson structure. And this is, of course, true for any adjoint G and for any decorated S. Now, uh, this theorem immediately implies that this modulus space can be quantized uh, because we quantized cluster Poisson varieties before. And that this can be quantized in an equivalent way with respect to this big group of uh, discrete symmetries of the space, which is very important. So why is this important? Yes? So do, do you now have a better understanding of the cluster mapping class group of this object? What do you mean better understanding? Well, before you, 
if we have this conjecture that you satisfy some modularity properties for gluing? That's a different, this is a different story. Okay. The, the, it, it's not, you can tie it to the mapping class group, but it's not related to the theorem. So we will talk about this, but not at this moment. So first of all, I wanted to have an application. So do you need to have punctures and components? Like if you have a closed surface? If I, if I have closed surface, then I get nothing. There is no statement. No, statement, no so nothing. No yes, it has to be, it has to be non-empty. It's not actually true. I say this emphatically, nothing, just to emphasize how the different situation is. But actually, it's not true that we get nothing. We get a lot. But this has a lot has to be obtained with a kind of with a big pain and with lots of work. We get, we get, we get basically all we want. And uh, I'm trying to explain uh, how we at least start to proceed. So remember that in the first lecture, uh, the main point was that we want to quantize, but we want to quantize the modular space log JS of local system, not anything else. Because this is really what is geometrically interesting. I mean, geometrically mean in applications, or at least you might think this. And so now the question is how we go from there to, to, um, to these applications. So, uh, let me just make a kind of, uh, Corrected definition. So let's say that log GS is the moduli space of G local systems on S uh, uh, plus pinnings at boundary. So this means that we parameterize the data which consists of G local system and the pinning. And we have uh, no framing. So there is no framing in this definition. So when I say local system, this means that at the punctures, I don't choose any other data. And for example, if I have a surface without boundaries, then that's the classical space of local systems. So now we can just say that we can define, remember that in the first lecture I said that if you consider Modular space of G local system on a puncture surface, we cannot approach it quantization right away because it could be non rational, so no coordinate could possibly exist. And so, uh, but now we can because we just say by definition that OQ of this log GS is by definition OQ of uh, PGS. Uh, and then we take just W and invariance acting there. So the point is that when we have forget the framing, it's like we're going to the quotient by the action of the W to N. And so that's indeed what happens, and it happens the most kind of classical way, just take invariance of the action of W on this, uh, on this algebra. Now, the, uh, uh, this extremely important point is that this theorem says that it's, it's gamma GS equivalent class percent variety, which means, in particular, that, so in particular, means that this group gamma GS acts by cluster Poisson uh, transformations. Uh, I have to, I don't want to do this right now, but there are very few exceptions to this fact. For example, the case of puncture torus SSL2 has to be excluded if you talk about the action of the veil group. Then the action of the veil group is not exactly clustered. There are very few special cases which I don't want to bother you right now, but so I just state like that, 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 that this group acts by class transformations. Because it acts by cluster transformations, uh, we can, and we do this a little later, we would be able to quantize Uh, log js, quantized in the you know, actual sense, because we would just consider the Hilbert space assigned to this space and just consider the actions there of this intertwining operators, which we just construct, which correspond to Wn. And so this pair is the quantization of the modular space of local systems. So it's, it's like Hilbert space with additional data with the action of this group W. So, okay. So now the next thing, so, so far, I explained that at least one part of this uh, uh, cluster nature of this data is useful because the W action allows you to, 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 to quantize in a strong sense the modular space of usual local systems. 
But uh, before we proceed to any kind of quantization, we need to uh, ask that to address the main question, what is the center of this algebra, OQ? Because that's what governs uh, the series of representations you're going to get. And so that's the next part of the general uh, data uh, which we have. So it's, I would say this was A. Yeah. So B is describing uh, the center of OQ of PGS. And here I introduce, so when I describe the discrete symmetries, this was group gamma GS. Now I want to introduce the group HGS. It's a torus, which is given by the product of Z Cartan groups over the punctures, multiplied by the product of the Cartan group, but actually uh, flavors of the Cartan group related to the boundary components. So now pi, right, so all boundary components. So let's take this group. So let me give you an example of how all this looks like. This is going to be a major example because this is the simplest example where you have all this kind of data. So you can take a punctured disk. I have different colors for all of this. So you have punctured disk. It has two special points. And that's it. Now, uh, in this case, if you're talking about this group, then first of all, so in this case, the group H G S is what? So first of all, this is the cartan which comes from the puncher. And you can actually make it in two different colors if you want it. So we have the cartan group which comes from the puncher. And we have the cartan group which comes from the boundary. They are very different, so to speak, in their nature. And so that's the second factor, red, and the first factor kind of greenish. OK. Now, what's the statement? The statement is that there exists canonical map to this HGS. Uh, mu, which is map from PGS to HGS. Now I have to break the lecture because now I remember something important which I forgot to tell you. So the next lecture, Friday, July, 12. I believe this is Friday. Yes. So the next lecture is 8, 9, 10. Yes. The next lecture is not Wednesday, it's Friday. OK. There is a canonical map to this group, uh, which I write as a map which has two components, the component related to the punctures and the component related to the boundary components. And now we actually halfway to know this map. Because what is the map from PGS to the product of Cartan groups? This comes from the data 1B. So this map, it comes from 1B part. Now, how is the map mu P? So the boundary components, uh, you see it in the part 3. And indeed, there is something which corresponds to map to some kind of Cartan group. So this is just the product. And so this comes uh, basically for the part uh, 3B. And so this is the, where the projection to Cartan comes from. And now the theorem. Let's call theorem C. But first of all, if you consider the pullback 
of the algebra of functions on this torus, this is the center uh, of the Poisson algebra uh, of functions on PGS, which I did not, by the way, introduce. So we did not yet introduce the Poisson structure in this space because the very existence of this Poisson structure follows from theorem B, which says that the model space PGS has cluster Poisson structures. It's Poisson. But why it's Poisson? I mean, what kind of Poisson structure we still have to discuss, so we don't uh, yet know. But still, it's going to be center. And B is, of course, quantum version that if you consider the same subalgebra, This is the center of OQ of PGS if uh, Q to n is not equal to 1. If Q to n, if Q is the root of unity, the center is huge and not just coming from this kind of torus related to GNS, but if it's not, then this is the center. And uh, uh, then you can ask the question, what is the center of the local systems? And for the local systems, you can take mu star of this O of HGS, but you can put W invariance, and this is the center of OQ of log GS. Okay, now we know the centers of all the spaces, which means that when we go into quantize, uh, we know that the corresponding uh, family of Hilbert and the related Schwartz and space of distribution spaces, the corresponding triples of spaces will be parameterized by the real, po real points of those torus. That's the main uh, corollary. So therefore, the spaces of uh, quantization are parameterized by either H G S of R plus or this H G S of R plus uh, divided by the uh, action of W to N. But I insist that I stress that it's, they are parameterized not just by real points of the Cartan group, they are parameterized by real positive points of the Cartan group. All right, so uh, now let's look uh, what do we have. So we have, we handled one. We are not going to handle three today, but I can probably explain where does the two coming from. And so in the statement two, there are two um, kind of statements. So the first question is about this potential and the second statement is about uh, the, uh, this projection to Cartan. So let me explain the simpler one, so where do we get the projection to Cartan? So this will be 2b. So so when we talk about 2b, we take a part of the boundary Uh, where you see this uh, uh, red special point, and then we have this extra data. So we have two decorated flags, like call them A minus and A plus, sitting near this point. And then this clearly means that there exists a unique element of the Cartan group uh, such that it is the ratio of these two the created flex, meaning the second is h times the first. And so we just define this map rho sub s related to this special point s, uh, applied to the triple given by the local system framing and pinning uh, to be just this h. And so this is the first time you really see uh, the application of this framing. So if we didn't put the framing, uh, we would not have uh, this projection to Cartan group here. But since we do have framing, it's completely obvious that we have projection to Cartan. 
And uh, it does play a major role in the description of the center and in the other thing. And so maybe, like I supposed to finish maybe in one minute, what if I finish like in five minutes? Uh, just thinking, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I just, maybe I just stop here. Uh, oh no, one thing, yeah, one more thing which I can say easily. So what is about 3B? So we had 2B, so we defined projection to Cartan, but in 3B we have uh, for every boundary component, so for example, you can consider a boundary component like that, uh, as we did on the, or you can consider boundary component with two special points or with three special points. We still have to get to projection for the Cartan group, and so, for boundary component pi, uh, we define the projection mu sub pi to be the following one. So we consider this element of the Cartan group which corresponds to the first point, but then we have the second point, the third point, the fourth point, and so on. And so we take projection to Cartan for the first one and then multiply by projection to Cartan to the second one but with a star. Star is this involution of the Cartan group. Then we multiply by the projection to the third one, and then to projection to the fourth one, star. And if we happen to have uh, odd number of points, so this is if we have even number of points. If we have odd number of points, then we have rho s1, rho s2 star, rho s3, but now it uh, actually lives uh, where it's supposed to live. So it lives in H sub P in the, in the space of co-invariance. I mean, in H, we call it H star. This just lives in H. So why is this is so, you can argue in many ways, but there is, you have to start from some, so from some point and you can easily see that this definition will be okay. This will not be quite okay if you project to Cartan. So we are forced to do this. So that's it. So now we have one AB. Uh, 2b and 3b uh, done. So we still have to do 2a, I will do this next time, and, and 3a, and I have to explain the, the main uh, representation theoretic and uh, geometric applications of the quantization. And uh, in the end, if I have time, I will explain how we introduce the coordinates. It actually takes not that long time. Uh, the main theorem, why is this? I just want to stress one thing that uh, mm, it is not, I mean, it, it's not, it takes not that much time to introduce coordinates using some data, but uh, it is uh, quite di difficult to prove that these uh, coordinate systems, they all sit together in this very strict way, uh, uh, that they form cluster Poisson variety. And the main difficulty of the statement lies on the boundary. So if we would settle for uh, the situation when we don't have a boundary, like for example, consider just triple of flags, the proof will be much, much, much easier. I mean, basically quite easy. But because, for example, this is the case of triangles, basic case. Because we have to, to handle the boundary uh, as well, the proof is much, much more complicated because of that. And so, in a sense, the really the, the, the whole difficulty sits in the boundary. And we actually, that's what we use when we glue. So when we glue, we really use the boundary components to glue. And so I emphasize again and again that putting extra data to the boundary was key uh, for, for the whole thing, was key for localization of the notion of local system, key for introducing right notion, making its work on triangle, otherwise we cannot do this, and it's a major uh, problem in order to prove something. Okay, so we'll do this next time. That's it for today.